hearts, our eyes, our minds. Give us revelation. Give us understanding. Give us knowledge. Help us to be transformed in the name of Jesus. Amen. Will you open your Bibles this morning to Philippians chapter 2? I want to talk about Christ, uh, the suffering servant. Uh, Christ came to serve. I mean, we're talking about God in the flesh. Uh, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world. All religions, but the reality of Christ, their deceptions, their lies, their false. I think I heard the other day somebody said there's like over 4,000 different religions in the world. And only one of them is real. And that's Jesus Christ. And he became a man and dwelt among us. And we behold his glory. Now, I, 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 love, I love Christianity. I really do. I love the gospel. I, I, I love the reality of Jesus. Now, before I got born again, I, I was aware because I was a Catholic. And, and we, we, you know, none, none of us, as far as I, I knew, that I knew, knew Christ. But we knew, we knew the fundamentals. We, we did believe he was born of a virgin that he was God in the flesh, that he had been crucified, he died, and he rose again. And, and, and really, that's the only really days that we celebrated in, in my home because we weren't what we would call uh, real devoted or de uh, devoted Catholics, but we would go to midnight, class, uh, midnight mass, and, and then we would go to Easter, and and we, we'd go to Good Friday. So we knew these things. So when, when I fell to my knees at 19 years old and I cried out to Jesus Christ with all my heart, I entered into an amazing world that I, 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 I never, I had no concept that existed. How, how many know what I'm talking about? I just, I didn't know it existed. And it, it just, it blew my mind, and, and then when I picked up my Bible, because I never, even though when I was in boot camp, they gave you, I don't know if they do it anymore, they gave you a small little green Bible, it was King James, and I dug it out of my uh, duffel bag, and, and, and I began with Matthew, and, and in that little Bible, it wasn't the whole Bible, it was just basically Psalms and Proverbs and uh, the books of wisdom, and, and then the New Testament, and, and, and I began to read these amazing realities of who Jesus was and what he said and what he did. And, and at that time, of course, I didn't know Hebrews where it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. And, 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 and that blew my mind because that told me that whatever Jesus had done in his earthly ministry, he still would do it to this day. Amen. Come on. <laughs> I mean, to me, that's amazing. Yeah. And of course, then, you know, I'm, I'm not going to Bible school. I'm not being discipled by anybody but, but the Word of God. I'm being discipled by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You might say, I was being discipled by Jesus himself. Now, how, how many of you know that all of us are imperfect? Yeah. And, and really... You know, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all men. Well, you know, Paul said, follow me. And then he said something, follow me as I follow Christ. So he wasn't saying he was the perfect example. And matter of fact, he said, I have not yet apprehended that for which I've been apprehended. And, and we know in the early church, I mean, no, as long as we're in the flesh, we're going to have contention. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Because even, you know, Paul and, Paul and Silas got into it a little bit. They tangled a little bit. Or was it Paul and Barnabas? Paul and Barnabas, you know, they had a dispute over John Mark. And, and, and then even Paul and Peter butted heads because Peter came down to the Galatian church and he was sitting with the Gentiles. But when the Jews came down from, from Jerusalem, he got up and because it was not right uh, for them to sit with the Gentiles. The only thing is they didn't have the revelation that that dispensation was over with. Amen. 
that there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. You know what I'm saying? So they didn't understand God brought them into a whole new world. But all the promises, think about this. You know, we're talking about I surrender all. I surrender all. Now reach up and grab that. How many know that's your choice? That's your choice. And, and I wish we could all uh, uh, say, yes, every part of my life I have completely surrendered. Well, you may think that like Isaiah did until the day he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And then he began to cry out, woe to me. I'm a man of unclean lips in the midst of unclean people. And so Isaiah found out, no, no, there's always more of you that has to die. Because if you were completely dead to self, you would be walking exactly where Jesus walked. I mean, completely. He had the spirit without measure. Amen. But I just love the word of God because, you know, when I began this journey 49 years ago, it was just me and Jesus. And you need to grab that because we have each other, like uh, Pete said. We, we, we're the body, but really, when everything is said and done, it's going to be you and Jesus. Because on the day of judgment, I, I'm, I'm not standing there looking at you. God is looking at you. And God is going to require from us. And, and he's going to say this. He's going to say, what would you do for me? What would you do for me? And really, you know, in him we live and move and have our being. And, 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 and I love these realities. You know, it says, God is a sun and a shield. God will give grace and glory. No good thing, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Wonderful. The thief on the cross, you know, he was on the wrong side for a little bit. How long did it take for him to shift? You know, I love, I love uh, the sermon. If you were here, Shelley uh, Landon preached on, on Sunday night, and she was emphasizing the fact is no one is beyond salvation. There's so many that don't know Christ today. And as we look at them, and we think there's no hope for them. And I, I didn't realize this. Uh, they, they literally, they, they, I don't know how many, they figured for about 12 years, 13 years, Saul of Tarsus was persecuting the church. I never knew it was that long. I never really studied it. And yet, out of 13 years, can you imagine being driven by a wrong spirit? I mean, he was driven by a wrong spirit. 13 years, he's driven by a wrong spirit. And in his heart, in his mind, because he, he said, I did it sincerely in ignorance, he thought he was right with God. But then he had a Holy Ghost encounter with Jesus. Don't we need those encounters with Jesus? Life-changing, transforming, never the same kind of encounter. How many of you have had that? And, and Paul said, I will even come to more of those experiences. I'm going to have more of those encounters. Well, you know, people say, well, Pastor Mike, should we really be seeking encounters? No, no. Let me tell you this. Draw nigh to God and he will. God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And, 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 you know, life is strange because one night you might go to bed and you're kind of like, you know, humdrum. You know, you're kind of like, yeah, I'm a believer. Uh, you know, I go to church maybe. Uh, you know, I do God's will. But something can shift in the night where all of a sudden the Spirit of God wakes you up and you jump up out of bed and you can't wait to get to God. Really? Well, even the prodigal son did that, didn't he? That prodigal son, he, he lived with his daddy all those years. And yet he didn't appreciate his daddy. He didn't love his daddy like he should have. It was all about him, me, myself, and I. And then all of a sudden, what happened to him? He was in the pig pen. He's in the down and out. Now listen, he's been in that pig pen for some time now. He wasn't just in that pig pen one day and he said, oh, I need my daddy. No, he was in there. He was almost to the point he's eating the pig food. And all of a sudden, something happened in his heart. And there's a shift. Boom. 
All of a sudden, he wants God. <coughs> it kind of reminds me, I was in the Navy, and I had, he's still a friend of mine, Dale Eastman. And uh, Dale was in my same barracks. And uh, Dale was from South Dakota. Me and him were going to get out of the Navy about the same time. And he had a big old poster of a big, a, a bunch of pigs above his bed, a sow. And everybody seemed like that I was ministering to him. Matter of fact, Brother Lloyd Olds, and any of you can talk to him in his, in his 80s now, he was my chief. He was over the, mil, uh, the, the police on that. And, and the other day I was putting something up there, and, 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 and Lloyd just loves to go on. He said, yeah, I know all these men Brother Mike was talking about. I was there. I saw it. I experienced all of these things that he's talking about. And, uh, but anyway, so Dale never wanted to hear about God. Dale, he was kind of a laid-back guy. He, he wasn't really what we would say in the sin. You know, he wasn't rough and tumble like a lot of us. He was just a good old country hick, you know. And uh, so he would never, never, he, he'd say, Mike, I can't. I can't. I can't make Jesus my Lord. He said, because if I do, I'll never be able to fulfill my dream. I'll never be able to raise pigs. And, and I told him, no, I'm just a 19-year-old, you know, been saved for a couple months. I said, Dale, the devil's lying to you. I said, the devil's lying to you. I said, God will use you even as a pig farmer. Well, we left. I never, now he had given me his home address. And so it was, uh, that was in 1975. So in 1977, I'm driving a motorcycle uh, out to the West Coast. And I'm going to go up the Alcan Freeway. I'm going back to Alaska, you know. And the Spirit of God, was, and he did. He drew me up to Alaska. And that's how I ended up in Pennsylvania with an evangelist. But anyways, so I had Dale's address. So I, I go out and, 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 and I end up in South Dakota in all these cornfields, right? And so I take these backcountry roads, you know, and I finally find this farmhouse. And there's a pig farm. And there's two Harley Davidsons parked outside. So I go, I knock on the door, and this older lady answers. It must have been, I don't know if it was his grandma, I don't think it was his mother. And uh, I said, well, I'm looking for Dale Eastman. They said, well, you know, he's got this pig farm, but he also works a secular job. He'll be home in a couple hours. Why don't you just come on and hear these two big, burly, like Harley Davidson guys. I mean, they look like, you know, they were big. And, and back in them days, hardly anybody had tattoos, but they were covered tattoos. So I got in there, you know, I'm sharing Christ with them. And all of a sudden, I heard a car pull up outside, and here's like a big old, here's a, an old Chevy Bel Air or something. And, he got, and Dale gets out of the car, and he's got a big old floppy hat on. He sees me, throws his hands up in the air, says, praise the Lord. And I say, praise the Lord. And we hugged one another. Well, he got gloriously born again and filled the Holy Ghost. But see, I never stopped praying for Dale. I never got, see, God will lay people on your heart. How many of you know that? And, and there should be people laid on your heart, not just family members. And you just begin to stand in the gap. You just begin to take authority over the demonic powers. You just begin to spit, speak life over them. I, I know here about a year ago, there was a guy who uh, we were putting up this building. His name was Jeff Smith. And we're putting up this building. And Jeff pulled in. He didn't, he didn't know Christ and uh, but he had done some steel. You knew Jeff Don. You, we, we were with there with them and and and, and led Donnie to led uh, Jeff to the Lord and, and led him uh, into the Holy Ghost. And now he's in there. And for a number of years, he, he worked with us. Well, I'm sorry to say his wife left him and his life began to tumble down. And he left the church for a while and went to another church and met another woman and married her. And he came back here for a while and the church fell apart and. And, and, and poor Jeff, for a while, he, he come underneath the influence of a doctrine that once you pray to prayer, you're good to go. And so Jeff really, he, he really got bad. And I would run into Jeff. And I remember I had ran into him one day and he literally laughed at me. I'm not speaking, I'm going to tell you what happened to him. He mocked me and he, 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 he got so bad, he, he was going to burn down our building. That's how bad he got, you know. But then... Pam Pritt called me up one day and said, Brother Mike, uh, Pastor Mike, Jeff got prostate cancer. And I've been praying for him now. I never gave up on him. He was a good friend. He was a good buddy. 
I mean, me and him worked together in this building, and I began to cry out for his soul. And this must have went on for about 15 years where I just cried out for, to, for God to touch Jeff. And I'm sure other people were too. But I, I began to really pray for Jeff, you know. And, and that's what we do. We pray for one another, right? And, and I never spoke evil about him. I never backstabbed him. I never attacked him. I never demeaned him. I never told him, well, you know what that Jeff Smith is up to. And you can ask my wife and my kids. And every time I'd see him, I'd try to talk to him. I'd try to reach out to him, you know. But he didn't want nothing to do with me. And then all of a sudden, one day, I got this phone call. And here it was Jeff. And he's crying over the phone. I start crying with Jeff. He said, Pastor Mike, I'm so sorry. He said, I'm so sorry, and I, I, I know you've never done me wrong. You've never done me evil, and you've always been there for me, pa Brother Mike. And, of course, we know it's Jesus in us because I, I, I wasn't like that, you understand, before I got saved, you know. I, I, I didn't help people except my own friends, you know. And uh, so he came one time, and he visited, and he recommitted his life to Jesus. He got right with God. And they went home to be with the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. And, and so I, I'm so overwhelmed that this morning I was thinking about my journey and my family's journey and what we've been through and what we've experienced. And, and, and nobody can walk in our shoes. Nobody can walk in your shoes. Nobody has walked where you walked and done what you've done and been where you've been. And we're all different, aren't we? Yeah. And, and that's why it says love covers a multitude of sin. And, 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 and so... I, 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 I'm overwhelmed in some days more than others with such a heart of gratitude. My wife and my kids were around the table this morning as we ate breakfast. And, and, and I was just sharing with them, I'm, I'm so overwhelmed with how good God has been to us. What amazing blessings that God has given to us. And, you know, somebody I saw the other day on Facebook, I reposted it. I thought it was pretty interesting. They showed this, uh, this actor who was young, and now they showed him old. And then they gave these amazing statistics that the most productive time in a person's life, it's hard to believe, is like from 60 to 68. Can you imagine? That's the most productive time in many people's lives. The second most productive is from 69 to 80. And then the third most productive is from 50 to 60. So, uh, Pete, we're smack dab in the middle of the most productive times of our life. Hallelujah. Now, I, I realize this. I don't hear all the gossip and the rumors, but I, I, I know some people are upset with the books I've written, you know. And you're just too caught up in that. But you know what? Amazon sent me some information the other day. It blew me away. 60 million books are on Amazon. Did you know that? 60 million books. And, 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 and out of all of those books, for some reason, I just got a call from Massachusetts yesterday, last night, and someone got a hold of my book who owned the conference center and, and got a hold of my book, one of my books, and it blew them away, and they want me to come up and to preach for them. I mean, this, this, God's just opening doors. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and so out of, I'm thinking 60 million books. And so uh, as an author, I can go and I can find out where my books are at because it's all about Jesus. It's all about God. It's all about what he's done. I can find out where I'm at. And out of 60, like my best-selling book, out of 60 million books, I'm at number 20,000. So, so that means... Almost all my books are in the top 1% bracket on Amazon. Now, I'm bragging about Jesus, see? I'm saying if you're faithful over the little, God will make you a ruler over much. So, Pastor Mike, does that really matter? Yeah, it's lives we're touching. It's people hearing the truth, and the truth will transform them. And they will be set free. So Jesus in Philippians, listen, this, Paul says this. It's so amazing and we don't have a lot of time. But look here. If they're there before any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, 
if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, how? That you be like-minded. You know, later on, Philippians, when he says that I might know him, the power of his resurrection, fellowship of suffering, and let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded. The word perfect there means mature. So he's talking along the same content in, in chapter 4, but he says this. Having the same love, being of one cord, of one mind. Say one mind. So we got to understand what mind is he talking about here. This is what we got to understand. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Now, I know David when he came and uh, Goliath comes out, right? And he, and, and he begins to say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And his older brother comes and he says, I know your naughty heart. For in other words, he was telling David, you're being glorious, David. And you know what David did? He didn't argue with it. He didn't fuss with it. You know what he did? He said, is there not a cause? Say that with me. Is there not a cause? Remember the time that the apostles or the disciples saw someone casting out devils in his name and they forbade him. And Jesus said to them, let them alone. You know, that's what I've really tried to do. I try to bring doctrine through the years to bring correction to the body, but I let people alone. Here, I had a guy on Facebook just the other day, and he's a Raymond grad, and he basically wanted to debate me. I don't debate people. <laughs> How many of you learn not to debate people? We don't debate people. We just give them the truth. Isn't that what Jesus did? Don't argue with people. You know, my wife repeated to me one of my famous quotes, a, a, a person persuaded against their will is of the same opinion still. You ain't going to change. If you've been married for three months, you know that's true. You've been married for two weeks. I've been married to my precious wife for going on 46 years. If she's, if she's got something in her mind, I'm not going to change her by verbally talking to her. Guess what? If, if she's wrong and I'm right, and a lot of times it's the opposite, <laughs> I've got to pray for her. Y'all believe that God answers prayers? Yes. Does God answer prayers? Yes. Well, sure he does. He eyes of the Lord over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. And, and, and I know people talk about the power of prayer. It's actually the power of Christ. But we pray. And so he says this. Look what he says here. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. For in other words, check your heart. What are you doing it for? Is it to glorify you? Is it to exalt you? Is it to magnify you? Or are you doing it out of strife? Are you doing it out of bitterness? Are you doing it out of anger? Check your heart. It doesn't say check one another's hearts. You know, how many of you know that every car, most cars have what we call a dipstick? How many of you know every car has a dipstick? Tell somebody, leave my dipstick alone. <laughs> you know what that Rick means, right? Don't get under my hood. You check out your own dipstick, right? And how I many know of, and, and oil is symbolic of love. I know Kathy one time, we, we kind of had a nice Ford Astro all-wheel drive van. It wasn't a new van. And uh, she had gone away somewhere. And here, the, the, we, we used to call them the idiot light, you know? The oil light came on. The oil light. How I many know when the oil light comes on, what do you do? You shut it off, right? You turn that puppy off. Well, she didn't know what that, she knew it had a problem. We didn't have a cell phone. And guess what she did? <laughs> she kept on driving it. How many can guess what happened to that engine? It, it, it wrecked the engine. You can't run a car without oil. Listen, you can't live. You can't live your life without love. Love. You got a agape love you got to be quick to forgive. Or there's going to be all that friction, all that heat. And those, those bearings are going to freeze up. You might throw a rod through the head. Is that right, Donnie? Throw a rod through the head. I mean, 
And, and when, the, when, 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 the, when, when you say, what's my idiot like, Pastor Mike, when, when, when all of a sudden you begin to think bad things about somebody? That's your idiot light. <laughs> you began to think negative things about somebody. You shut down the engine and you get it filled with oil. Or you go before God and you get right with Jesus. <laughs> Is that not good information? Isn't that what we should do? And matter of fact, it says in James, because James saw the friction, he said, uh, and matter of fact, Galatians, Paul said, take heed lest you devour one another. You know, because they're fussing and they're fighting. And what does that have to do with this? Well, we're going to see this in a little bit. Let nothing, say nothing. nothing. I memorized this book back in about 1997, the book of Philippians. And let me tell you something. It's always, thank God for his word because it always convicts me. It always chastises me. It always speaks to me. So I don't need to have somebody harping on me. God's word does it. I say something bad to Kathy, and I'm telling you, before I walk away from her, my heart smokes me. And I go, oh, I should have never said that. I shouldn't. And she'll tell you that I'm the one who's very quick to come back to her and say, I'm sorry, baby doll. I'm sorry. She, she does once in a while. But, but you say, well, why doesn't she do it more? Because I'm probably the one who's in the wrong more than she is. So what Pete said about my wife is true. She is a pillar. She's an incredible woman. I'm telling you, I put that little girl through so much you don't even want to know. And yet the love of God in her heart, love in her heart, has kept her at my side. Oh, hallelujah. Hey, you may not be happy, but I'm happy. <laughs> let nothing, listen, let nothing be done through strife for vain glory, but in lowliness of, notice, one mind, lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Do what? You're supposed to treat others better than you treat yourself. Wow, just think if we'd have that in our marriage. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Right, Alice? Wouldn't that be awesome? Right? Yeah, yeah. We just treat each other better than ourselves. Amen? We, 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 you, you, you'd have him spoiled and he'd have you spoiled. Oh, you probably already do. <laughs> and so it says, esteem others better than themselves. Look not, look at, look not every man on his own thing. For other words, don't make your life as yourself as the priority. Look not every man in his own thing. And, and, and now it's not telling us to be busy buddies here. So you got to understand this by the Spirit. Look not every man in his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean I'm sticking my nose in the wind in Kathy's life. But it means what I'm saying is that when God reveals something to me and he speaks to my heart, I need to try to help them as much as I can. It means go, isn't that the, sec, the, the first command? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and being. And the second one is like unto it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Amen. So I'll, I want to do for you what I'd like to have done for me. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Can I hear, hear a loud Amen. By the way, the Jaegers are walking by faith today. I made a big mistake. I began to get congested. And Kathy wanted to go and get soft ice cream. I'm not picking on her. I tried to talk her out of it. Of course, somebody said, it's your fault, Mike. You ate it. And I said, I know. So we ended up, we ended up taking Barry and, and Shelly. They'll be back in about a week. And because uh, we're, we're helping them get their books. We're helping them get their books on, up, up on Amazon. And we've got two books. Now we're on our third book because she had six books that she went through publishing companies and they're all, they're all shut down. I'm just trying, it's Jesus, see? It's this Jesus because we, we want to get the word of God out there, see? And we read a wonderful little book to our children called the In Search of the Morning Star. It was published through Harrison House and Harrison House shut down. You couldn't get that book no more. 
So we had met Shelly before, and so I said to my wife here a couple of months ago, I said, honey, let's get a hold of Shelly if we can, and God did. And I said, let's see if we can get that book back up there. We don't get nothing out of that book. See, it says looking on to others, that you can help others. I mean, that's why we helped Joanna and Randy with their book, which is powerful. And I don't even know if our name's in the book, but you know what? We wanted them to take what they've learned to help others. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Help others. Why? Because there's one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Right? And, and, and you know, I've been in this thing for 49 years and, and, and if, if the body of Christ was doing what Jesus taught, oh, how wonderful it would be. Amen. Now, in heaven, there's none of this competition stuff, you understand. There's none of this building our own selves or building our own ministries or building our own churches. That's why I've never really been good at trying to get a church to grow because really, I, 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 I just really want people to be a part of the body. I just want them to be a part of what God's doing because there's only one body. I mean, that's what Paul said. There's one Lord, one faith, one body, one God and Father above all, through all and in all. Man, that's what I'm looking. I'm looking forward to the body of Christ. And, you know, heaven is full of nothing but unity. So. It says, look not every man in his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be where? In you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Wow. For in other words, him and the father were equal. Do you believe that? Yes, I believe it. I mean, they've always existed and they were equal. I mean, they were at the same level. I don't understand it. The word I mean, it was the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. But made himself, listen, here's the key. Make yourself of no reputation. Make yourself of no reputation. Make it about Jesus. Don't make it about your anointing, your giftings, your power, your position. Make it about Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Let's make it about Jesus. No matter where God sends you, no matter what you do, no matter what get, because the body is out here working in the harvest. That's what we're called to do, aren't we? Work in the harvest, but make it about Jesus. And if, if I do that, if you do that, we'll be able to stand before God, and I believe he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You made it about me. Hallelujah. <laughs> but made himself of no reputation and took him upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. Now he took, now you understand. Oh, and I preached on this Thursday night because I, I did a book called The Heart of a Servant and I published it this week because this, this, God just began to speak to me about servanthood. See, before I got born again, I'll tell you right now, I was not a servant. It, what do I mean by a servant? I, it, was, it was about Mike Yeager. But when, when I got born again, God put within me this, this desire to serve people. And, and the Bible says, serve one another. Now, I, I, now you got to understand, you got to be clarify this, because Paul said, if I'm a yet a servant, man, I'm not a servant of God. So w when I say serving others, you serve them as God leads you. You serve, you serve people as God tells you to. Because there'll be people that they're going to try to pull from you, right? I mean, I've dealt with a lot of guys from jail, a lot of homeless people, and, and, and they're really, really, they can be demanding. And, and I tell them, I've had people want me to do things for them. And uh, I have people all the time want, calling me up and want me to pay their rent. And, and, and I don't pay their rent. I said, I can't do that. I'm, I'm, I'm a good. If God tells us that we need to do that, we'll do that. And we've had God many times tell us to help people out. You understand what I'm saying? But we're a servant of God, right? And, and, and the word servant, literally, in, 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 and there's two different Greek words. We won't get into that. But it means one who, who and, and this context is one who voluntarily 
gives, them to, gives himself to another for their benefit. Jesus volunteered to come to the earth to become a man, to take a position lower than the father who he was equal to. Now listen to this. And when he did that, he will never be equal to the father again. Now that, that's really strange, ain't it? He was equal to the father forever. I mean, there was no time. And, but now, matter of fact, the Bible says, when you read the book of Revelation, the day will come when Jesus gives the crown to the Father. So Jesus willingly, the Word became flesh, and then willingly took a position of servanthood to the Father throughout eternity. Wow. Throughout eternity. And matter of fact, the Bible says the day will come when we simply stand before the Lord and we say, Lord, we've only, we're, we're, we've only done that which was required for us to do. You know why? We've been bought by the blood. I don't know if you know this, but a lot of people don't understand why did Jesus keep, keep saying and why did they get mad at him when he said that he, uh, that he was the son of God? He was the son of God. He was the son of God. Well, I really, if you want to be technical about it, there's only one son of God and that's Jesus. I'm talking about, you, you might say in, in, in an organic sense or a biological sense, Jesus is the only biological son of God. Well, what are we? We are adopted sons. Amen. We're adopted. Isn't that wonderful? So every human being, God the Father has adopted us. But Jesus was the only begotten son of God. And he became a servant. And what did he do? Not only did he become as a servant, but remember, Jesus said, I didn't come to, to, to be served. I come to serve. Now, listen, Jesus, because now, say, I have flesh, and we all have flesh. How many know you got to crucify your flesh? Every day. I mean, Jesus, you know, Paul said, I die daily. Paul the Apostle said, I die daily. So uh, Mike Yeager has got to die daily to what? My flesh. Because what my flesh wants is going to be the opposite of what God wants. So it goes on, and he said he made himself with no reputation, took upon him a form of servant, was made in likeness of man, being found in fashion as a man. He did what? He humbled himself. Who's going to humble you? Somebody going to humble you with their mouth? No, they're going to harden you. You got to humble yourself. You got to bend the knee. You got to submit to God. You got to say, now, do you know what humility is saying? Okay, this is what the Bible says. I believe it. That's not what I was taught. That's not how I was raised. That's not how I was indoctrinated, but this is what the Bible says. I will submit myself to this book. You know, I've told the congregation for over 40 some years, I said, listen, if you, if you find something I'm teaching and preaching that's wrong, just come to me with the word in context, and I will submit myself to it. And it happened, we still got a, a, a wonderful lady, uh, Mary Rockwell. She's now, Mom, did you know she's now in Florida? Mary Rockwell, and she was with us for many, many years. I gave her, by the Spirit of God, wasn't mean, I gave her a prophetic word. I said, your whole family's going to come in. She started crying, and I said, but your husband, it will be as if he is snatched out of the flames of hell. Well, her family began to come in through the years. We've known her probably for 40 years. And then uh, she moved away. Uh, she lived, she couldn't come. You know, she's almost 90 now. And one day she got a hold of me, she visited, and she said, Pastor Mike, remember you, those prophetic words you gave me about my family? He said, yeah, well, it all came to pass. But my husband, he was an old military, retired military man. And I tried to reach him before. He was just so hard, hard, hard. And he said, uh, but he ended up in the hospital with cancer. And uh, I remembered that word you gave me, that he would be like he was in the flames of hell itself. 
And, and I said, yeah, what happened? Well, I brought my pastor that I was going to, and I said, please come and see my, my husband. He's, he's close to death. And guess what? He went in there and began to speak to him. The man's heart broke, melted. He started weeping. He gave his heart to Jesus. So he's, he lived for a couple of weeks longer, and all he did was he was in the Bible, he was in prayer. And one day he told Mary, he said, oh, honey, I wish I would have known this truth all of my life, but I didn't. But he went home to be with Jesus. And, and Mary, one day I was preaching, and Mary came to me after the service and said, Pastor Mike, let's look at the Bible. I said, okay, let's open it up. So he opened up to the context where I was preaching. Now, let's read all of this, Pastor Mike, like I'm a little boy, you know. Let's read all of this, Pastor Mike. I said, okay, let's read it. He said, now, remember what you quoted? Uh, yeah, you took this scripture right here. I said, yeah. He said, look at Pastor Mike, you took it out of context. So I said, you know what, Mary, you're right. I took that out of context. Well, so that night I stood up and I repented. And people got mad at me. They said, oh, you're just double-minded. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not double-minded. I'm just flexible. What does the word of God say? It doesn't matter what anybody teaches. We need to be Bereans who study to see if what Paul teached was right. So he humbles himself, becomes obedient to death. And what did God do? Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. Woo, that the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow, things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth. Well, look, look here before we close in Matthew chapter 20, please. I just want to show you, and, and we don't have time, but there's many, many scriptures throughout the New Testament. How many know the body of Christ still has problems? How many know we still got problems? Is there anybody here today? I tell you, the only Christian that ain't got a problem is a, is a dead Christian. They ain't got no problems, man. Matter of fact, Randy came to me and he had a little bit of revelation. And he said, Pastor Mike, do you think before man committed sin, basically, that men cried? And I said, you know, that's a thought. Almost all of our tears is because of sin, isn't it? Connected somehow with sin. And that's what brought tears. You know, in heaven, the Bible says he's going to wipe away all the tears from your eyes and you'll never cry again. Now, I know there's a difference between crying over joy and crying. I said, maybe when Adam saw Eve, he cried out of joy. You know, like Wayne, when you first saw Kathy, did you cry out of joy? Yes, did. did you really? Yes. You did. Did you really? Did you? No, you did. You had me going there for a moment. <laughs> I thought, I got really happy when I saw Kathy, but I didn't cry and go, whoa, she's the one, you know. I didn't do that. Wayne, you had me going. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I've had, Kathy's cried many times since she's been married to me. <laughs> and not for good reasons either. Matthew 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven, and then he begins to tell us the parable about this man and working in the harvest field and in the vineyard. And so as we go on, it's, it's going to get quite interesting uh, because uh, he's talking about the harvest field. And, and, and then he begins to talk about in verse 18. He's going to Jerusalem. The son of man shall be betrayed. He's going to be delivered. So now he's really, listen, Jesus is sharing his heart with his apostles. Guys, I'm about ready to die. I'm about ready to be crucified. But, but listen how the flesh works. And, and this isn't just one time. This happened numerous times. And, uh, and, 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 and so uh, as he's telling them his sufferings in verse 20. We're going to close here a couple minutes. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring something from him. So I want you to see the context. He's talking about the harvest field. He's talking about what he's going to go, to go through now, right? And he said unto her, what will thou? Well, okay, the, the mother of, of John and, 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 and saith unto him, grant that these my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. Now, no, wait a minute. He's going to die. He's going to suffer. 
I mean, he's going to pay the price for our sins. And they're more concerned about their position in heaven. But yet God chose them. God chose these men. But I can show you, we don't have time. I can show you again and again and again where these men are button heads together because they are jockeying, jockeying for position in the kingdom. They want to be the greatest. They want to be the famous. They want to be the biggest. Jesus saith unto her, you know what, not what you ask you. Uh, are you able? Now listen, listen to this. Because we say this out of sincerity but ignorance. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? And to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And right away they said, yeah, we're able. We're able. We're, we can handle this. But how many know they couldn't do it? They couldn't do what Jesus was about to do. H have you? And, and I know Pete's been in the bush in Africa. And some of you, how many of you gone out and done missionary work in other countries? H how many know that there's people who really literally believe they could do what you did? But they couldn't handle it. The price it cost. It's going to cost you more than what you know, Pete and Sherry. The price is going to be greater than what you understand. But this will come through learning, because at this time, these guys don't know what's involved in all of this. What's involved in keeping a ministry afloat for 42 years, where many times there was nobody here. What's involved in really serving God and paying the price and doing what you got to do? What's involved in this? Kind of reminds me of a woman who was a concert pianoist. Tremendous pianoist. She got done. People applauded. Amazing. A young lady came up. Well, I think it was a lady her age and said, man, I'd give anything to play the piano like that. And a woman looked at her and kind of a, a holy indignation rose up in her and said, no, you won't. And they got to arguing. And the woman just kept on saying, no, you won't. And finally she said, listen, when I was a little girl and all my friends were outside playing, I was at the piano. He said, she said, when I was a teenager and all of my friends, they were involved in all kinds of activities, I was at the piano. In my college years, while everybody was going to those parties, I was at the piano. She said, no, no, you don't wish you could do what I, you, you could not do what I do. Why? Because there is a price to pay. We sang that song, I Surrender All. You want to move, we, do we want to move in the fullness of the Holy Ghost? Yeah. See, we say we do, but I haven't really I pay the price, and then, you know, the old flesh. How I many you got flesh? Y'all got flesh. I pay the price. I meditate. I pray. I fast. I seek God. And, and then, you know, discouragement will come, and the devil will come, and problems will come, and you back off again. And then you got to push in again. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You, 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 you take a hold of the bull by the horns, but then, then the enemy comes, and, and, and you back off a little bit. And, and uh, But here... Jesus, they said, we, we can drink the cup that you drink of. And, uh, and he says this to them. You shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared for my father. You know, and I, I, I've never, you know, I, and I saw, it's a ridiculous prayer. I said, Lord, if you just let me be a street, pre a street sweeper in heaven, I'll be happy. Just, just let me in. That's all. You know, whatever position you have for me, that's fine. But I want you to know is the very heart, the very character, the very nature of God is a servant. Because the night he was betrayed, and actually if you read in some of the different Gospels, once again they were fussing over who was going to be the greatest. And then he got down because that was the most. See, their streets were not like our streets. They were covered with mud and animal dung 
and animal urine. It was a filthy, you're, they wore sandals, they didn't wear socks, they couldn't. Because when you got to someone's house, your feet were covered with, with if you've ever been a farmer, you know what I'm talking about, you know. And so they were covered. How many of you guys ever ran in the swamp spur-footed? You know, I mean, I did, you know. And, and we'd get our feet all muddy and nasty and ugly. And so that when you would come to somebody's house, if it was a notable house, and they had servants, the lowest of the lowest of the lowest would get down and wash the nasty, stinky, smelly, dung, urine-covered feet of the people coming to the house. And so when they got to the upper room that night, Jesus, he got down and he washed their feet. And it wasn't to begin a tradition of washing people's feet. No, that was practical and that was what they had to do. And Peter was so offended. Peter said, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part to do with me. And, and you've got to connect the dots here because really what he was saying is this. He was saying, listen, Pete, if you don't become like I am, I don't want nothing to do with you. If you don't become like me, I really don't want nothing to do with you. Oh, he wasn't condemning him. He was just, if you don't want to be like me, and I got down and I'm your master. I'm your master. I'm the God of all creation. They didn't understand it at the time. The time would come when they would know that. He said, if I got down and I washed your feet and you won't let me wash your feet, you don't understand who I am because that's who I am. Aren't you glad that God is a God of servanthood? Aren't you glad that God left the splendors of heaven and came and walked in the midst of our filth, our unbelief, our ungodliness, I, I, we can't help it, it was in us. I understand these things. But Jesus said an amazing thing. He said, my father can raise up seed out of the rocks. God could have raised up a new, uh, a, 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 new gen, a, a new creation out of the rocks. But instead he decided to reveal who he really is out of his heart of servanthood. He gave himself for us. And now we can give ourselves to him. I did not have the heart of a servant. Oh, I'm still growing. I'm still maturing. I'm still developing this thing. So whenever I relate incidents, it, it, it's not Mike Yeager. It's Jesus in me. How many will acknowledge if there's anything good in you, it's Jesus? So I'll close with this one story. Most of you don't know it. I'd put it up on Facebook. But when we were in the old garage, remember that, Donnie? We did not have an inside bathroom. Matter of fact, I finally got a Jiffy John. But my father-in-law, he sold humus toilets. I think they called it humus. And what they do is they use a natural, it's, it's made for one or two people. That's what it's made for. And, and what it does is when, when you do your duty, you let it alone and it eventually turns it to dust. Well, how many know that ain't made for 60, 70 people? So Sunday morning would come along and we had a bathroom that was set up for this. And those people, especially in the wintertime, they'd go in there and of course they'd do their duty. I wish they'd done it before they got there, but. And we only had one. So I remember the first time we got it and I really didn't want it, but my father-in-law talked me into it. It was like four or $500 and I know he made a profit off of it. And so I, I went there and there's, in the front there's a flap and you got to take the screws off. Well, as I began to take the screws off, lo and behold, here comes a flood. I go, oh, and I shoved it back. I thought, I couldn't pick it up. It's a big toilet, you know. It's a big, hunky, heavy thing, you know. Probably way more modern now. 
I thought, what am I going to do? So I, screwed, so I thought, okay, I've got to get a bucket. I've got to get a, 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 a dustpan. I've got to get a, a, so I got all the tools I could, and, and I pulled it out, and here it comes like a flood. And so I'd scoop it up, and it'd take me a couple hours to clean that whole bathroom up. It was only a little bathroom, about maybe six by eight. And, and I, I really never got a bad attitude. I, I just thought, well, it's got to be done. I'm going to do it. And I would just do it. And I could always tell when we had a good congregation because the flow was much greater. <laughs> and and one, one Monday morning, I did it every Monday morning. One Monday morning, I'm in there, and I'm taking care of the sheep, and I'm singing in there, and, and you can hardly breathe, Wayne, and I'm singing... Oh, how I love Jesus, and I'm scooping the crap. I'm scooping it. I'm telling you what, no wrong attitude, nothing. Well, Brother Dick Klein, he came up to do some work, and he opened the door. Matter of fact, Mary's still in touch with us. She listens to the radio station all the time. And you couldn't believe Mary. Her voice is just as, remember that cheerful voice of Mary Klein? It's just as cheerful as it was over 40 years ago. And when our radio station's off the air, she lets us know because she can't hear it, you know, down in Woodsboro, Maryland. And so Dick opens the door and he says, Pastor Mike, and he grabs his nose. He said, what are you doing? And I looked up at him and I smiled. I said, I'm just simply cleaning up after the sheep. <laughs> and it was spiritual. It was spiritual. Because God put that in my heart. I can't lay and claim, oh, Pastor Mike, you're so humble, you're so this, you're, come on. And there's a lot of areas I'm not. But there's areas I am. And there are things that I will do that I know most Christians will never do. Because they never grabbed that servant heart. And I wrote that book for me. In these last days of my life, however many years God lets me, I don't need to become, no matter what position God puts me in, I don't need to be a, a big shot. The number one complaint I get from people all the time that call me all across America is they read my books or watch the YouTube channels. They said, Pastor Mike, we can't believe you answer the phone when we call. And they literally start weeping. They said, we can't get to the pastors. Sister Kelly told me something shocking the other day. She said, and she went to a very well-known church for 29 years, worked for them. She said, Pastor, I'm not speaking evil because those men are coming gone. She said, we could never get to the pastor. You had to go through the channels. We could just never, listen, if you can't get to me, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Now, I can't solve your problem. I can't heal you. I can't fix what's going on, but God can. So let's pray. Father, I just thank you. That even as Jesus was the suffering servant, that you would breathe into us a fresh breath of servanthood. Lord, where we will be willingly, and we do it as unto you, not unto men, we will willingly roll up our sleeves and we will volunteer ourselves, Lord, not to what men want us to do, but what you want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I really believe it was the heart of a servant when Jesus was on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Isn't God awesome? <laughs> I mean, it, see, I'm overwhelmed. God is so amazing to think he would reach down into our filth. You know, talk about me cleaning the, the sheep the, the sheep's dung, okay? Can you imagine what God's had to do for us? Not only that, but his soul went to hell. And he did it for you. I mean, that's how much he loves you. Joe, you need to start, stop doubting God's love for you, Joe. I'll say this in love. Stop doubting his love for you. 
He knew all the mess you were going to make before you were ever born. We don't justify it. But he proved his love. When he said, Father, forgive, they don't, he was talking about you and me, Joel. He was saying, Father, forgive Joel. Father, forgive Mike. For they know not what they do. He was saying that to you, Ray. Ray, I love you, but you are a mess without Jesus. And I can say that without you getting offended. I mean, you are an utter, complete mess without Jesus. But you know what? I'm just like you. Charles, without Jesus, oh my. Come on, Dan. Come on, Josefina. Come on. Help us. Reach up and grab his love. Grab his help. Grab that hope. What great hope we have in him. What great hope. And, and you know, that's what we're supposed to do now, aren't we? We're supposed to go out here and give people hope, right? Let's give people hope that in Jesus, it's going to be okay. So we're here to pray with you this morning. Don't leave this place discouraged. Don't leave this place down and out. Don't leave this place with no hope today. Leave with great hope. Because if God can be, is for you, who can be against you? Tell your neighbor, God is for you. He's not against you. And God will help you if you let him. Amen. Amen. Feels good, don't it, Brian? <laughs> Isn't God for you, brother? He's for us. So let's get the ministry team to come up here. And let's pray for anybody who wants prayer. If you see somebody missing that it's not here today, I want you to pray for them. Maybe call them up. Maybe call them up. If you see someone who's missing, you know, just call them up and say, hey, we missed you today. How many know this is not a one-man team? It's all of us together, ain't it? Amen. Amen.